Pokemon Go has been out in the UK for less than a week, and yet I think it's fair to say it's taken over our hearts, our minds, and our phone batteries. Sure, it may crash every seven seconds or so, but honestly, Pokemon Go is pretty cool, and it's had some pretty unexpected side effects on our lifestyles in the short time it's been available. So without any further ado, here are six things we've learned playing Pokemon Go. Okay, so we kind of have to lend our thanks to Pokemon Go's predecessor Ingress for laying the groundwork here, but Pokemon Go is pretty good at getting us to step out into the wider world, and more than once it's shown us stuff we didn't even know was right on our doorstep. I found a museum near my house I didn't even know was there, Aoife's found a new appreciation for street art, and Ian found a place near him described solely as balls. Turns out running after fictional animals is a pretty good way of finding new things to appreciate in your neighbourhood. Although, it has to be said... <coughs> now, generally speaking, I'm fairly reserved when I'm out in public, so ordinarily waving my phone around and flicking the screen in a state of deep concentration is fairly low on my list of priorities. Unfortunately, that's no way to get ahead in Pokemon Go, so one of the hardest lessons I've learned so far is that trying to catch a Pokemon in the street makes you feel like a complete and utter melon. That said, by the same token, it is pretty easy to spot other players. There's something nice about making eye contact with someone and sharing a grin because you know exactly what the other person is up to. Stories have been springing up all over the internet about people meeting other trainers, getting into conversations, and even organising walks thousands of people strong. Given how frequently people still try to typify gamers as insular loners, it's really cool to see this happening, and to be a part of it. And while we're talking about friendships... A Pokemon collection is a personal thing. In many ways, it's a reflection of self, especially if you go deep into naming conventions. So, just in the same way US President Ronald Reagan once said you can tell a lot about a fellow's character by the way he eats jelly beans, you really can tell a lot about a person by the way they name their Pokemon. Aoife and Ian, for instance, are both purists, refusing to name their Pokemon anything different, instead deferring to the names the Pokegod gave them. Chris has named his in a typically Chris Brat sort of way, with a Charmander called Flame Boy and a Nidoran called Top Lad. While I've been amusing myself by naming my Pokemon after famous authors, I've got a Drowsy called George R.R. R. Martin, a Zubat named Hunter S. Thompson, a Pidgeotto called Carol Ann Duffy, and my Bulbasaur is called Philip K. Dick. And speaking of Bulbasaur, actually... Pikachu! When Pokemon Blue and Red came out, I was seven years old, and picking my starter Pokemon was the most important decision I think I'd ever faced up until that point. In typical seven-year-old fashion, anyone who picked differently to me was not to be trusted, and I remember arguments about which is the coolest final evolution stretching on forever. Twenty years on, I found myself faced with the same decision, and the arguments... Well, if anything, the arguments have got more intense in the interceding years, and more hateful. I could read out these conversation logs, but the long and short of it is that Chris and Aoife are snobs when it comes to Pokemon, and Bulbasaur is just fine, thank you very much. I may not be speaking to either of them at the minute unless I absolutely have to, but nonetheless, it's still good to know the question of which Pokemon to start out with is no less important now we've all grown up and got jobs and stuff. Anyway, no matter how much we disagree on the relative merits of different Pokemon, we can at least agree on one thing. <coughs> Zubat is a pretty alright Pokemon under normal circumstances. It can fly, it's a nice purple colour, and it doesn't have eyes, which is a bit different. In Pokemon Go, however, Zubat is the devil incarnate. Will Zubat get in the Pokeball? Will it bollocks? Zubat is absolutely everywhere and pointedly refuses to be caught. I must have wasted 25 Pokeballs catching my first Zubat, and, as per point two on this list, I look like an absolute melon doing it. It made me wish I'd just stayed in and fooled Pokemon Go into thinking I was somewhere else using a mock GPS app. Speaking of which... So there are some areas on the vast map of Pokemon Go stuffed with Pokemon you don't have, and understandably, those areas are pretty tempting. But what if you don't live near those areas and can't spare the time to go there physically? You might think about using a mock GPS app, which will help you force your location and convince the game you're somewhere you aren't, thereby offering up Pokemon you otherwise wouldn't have access to. Well, 
don't do that. You won't get banned from playing Pokemon Go, but it will block you from doing anything until you go back and turn off the mock GPS. Thanks to Tom from Digital Foundry for cluing us into this one and admitting to cheating by trying to convince Pokemon Go that he was in Buckingham Palace. Better luck next time, Tom. And there you go, six things we've learned since starting Pokemon Go. What about you? What have you learned? Let us know in the comments. And if you'd like to watch some other videos on Pokemon Go, or just some other stuff in general, please feel free to click one of these. If you could also like and subscribe, that would be lovely. Thanks for watching!